Good afternoon, class. I apologize for posting this later than I said. I said I'd have it up by Friday, but it being Sunday here, just uh, before noon, uh, I got a little, little, uh, little busy with some stuff. Uh, but uh, I'll be posting this uh, as soon as I get done with it. Uh, if you do not have the chance to watch this uh, before class tomorrow, uh, of course I want you guys to watch it sometime before the final. Uh, we will try and go over some of the stuff uh, during class. Now, last class period we were talking about the 1980s. And I told you guys that I would post an online lecture of the post-Cold War America, so here it is. Now, after the end of the Cold War, which officially ends in, October, in, in December of 1989, so 89 is the sort of the bookend, the ending bookend, for the Cold War. So 1949 is sort of the official date of its start. 1989 is the year that it ends. And in the 1990s, uh, there's a hope that uh, the world will be a, a safer place, if you will, uh, a more peaceful place. Because as is coined by George Bush Sr., the post-Cold War period is a new world order. Now, whether or not this has sinister connotations or not, there is a new world order coming out of the 1990s. The, po the cold, cold War order is, is gone. This, this, this world divided between a U.S.-led West and a Soviet-led East is, is over with, and the world is in transition in the 1990s. Um, one of the biggest transition uh, transitions, of course, is what's going on in Eastern Europe. How are they dealing with um, the end of the Cold War and the fall of communism in countries like, you know, East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and things like that? So let's kind of talk about that really quick because in 1989 and 1990, we see some major changes in that part of the world. For example, Poland, of course, is a non communist government after the uh, spectacular success of solidarity. East Germany ceases to exist because in early 1990 the two Germanys, East and West, will become one Germany, the current uh, Germany. But it's not a Germany where the two are molding together and sharing attributes of each. Instead it is a West Germany taking over the territory and infrastructure of an East Germany that just quit quit being in existence. I mean, just it just ceased to exist. Of course, in the 1990s, uh, as we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, there is not peace in Europe. There is more war in Europe, and we'll talk about post-Cold War war here in a minute. Uh, but you also see uh, countries transitioning to a new form of government, but also a new, new boundaries peacefully as well. Czechoslovakia which is predominantly made up of Czechs on the one hand and Slovaks on the other. The Czechs live in the area closest to Germany, the Slovaks living, living in the area closest to what is today Ukraine. Uh, these two ethnicities, um, even though they don't hate each other, they don't like being in the same country together. So in late 1989 and early 1990, Czechoslovakia goes, undergoes what becomes known as the Velvet Revolution in which Czechoslovakia splits in half. And that's why today you have the Slovak Republic and the Czech Republic. Now, between 1989 and 1991, Glasnost and these forces that Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev, unleashed are going to have a, a fatal effect a fatally damaging effect on the Soviet Union because the Soviet people are being affected by this freeing up of information and their freedom to express their ideas um, just as much as Eastern Europe those in Eastern Europe have been able to and this unleashes forces that have been suppressed in the Soviet Union ever since the the Russian Revolution of 1917 one of these is, of course, the hatred of the Soviet system. 
uh, Soviet, the people of the Soviet Union can see that they are not living in uh, the communist utopia, that while Americans and Western Europeans have Walmarts where you have floor-to-ceiling food and other goodies, they have to wake up at 5 in the morning. And it's not fun waking up at 5 in the morning in the Soviet Union because it is cold most of the year. Uh, and you have to stand in a bread line so that you're in a position to get bread or meat or whatever the store is selling before they run out, you know, before lunch. You know, Soviet citizens, if you want to call them that, Soviet citizens live in little shoebox apart shoe apartment complexes and drive Ladas, which are the worst, probably one of the worst cars ever created. They see on these the new TV shows that are being allowed in the Soviet Union for the first time. They're seeing Westerners living in single-family homes or high-rise apartment complexes. They're seeing them drive Mercedes-Benz or fuel-efficient Nissans, not fuel-inefficient, polluting, terrible in terms of reliability, terrible reliability, Ladas. So that's one force that's being unleashed. A second force that's being unleashed in the Soviet Union is nationalism. As you can see down here on this map, the USSR actually stands for something. It stands for Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And these are individual republics, kind of like our states, that are ethnically based. So you have the Russian Republic. You have Kazakhstan for the Kazakhs. You have Uzbekistan. I believe it's down here in red. You have Ukraine, this place that you know is kind of in the news lately. You have Belarus. You have the Baltic states of Latvia, Lith Lithuania, and Estonia. You have uh, Georgia, not our Georgia, their Georgia. Uh, Azerbaijan, and you have numerous others that I can't remember off the face of, off the off uh, off the top of my head. And all of these represent an ethnic uh, group. You know, the the Latvians, the Lithuanians, the Ukrainians, the Kazakhs, the Uzbeks, the Georgians, um, the Russians, of course. And so, nationalism is unleashed by this freedom to communicate. It's not freedom that we have in the West, but it's enough. And you have all of these underground pamphlets and papers all of a sudden being made available to people in the Soviet Union. And many of these, these underground papers are arguing for, well, we, need, we want our own country if we're Lithuanian or we're Ukrainian. We want our own country. We don't want to be part of the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union is dominated by the Russians. Look how big Russia is, in pop, both in geography and in population. We, we want our own country where we are calling the shots. And so by 1991, these forces are pulling the Soviet Union apart. You know, people are protesting in the streets of major cities in the Soviet Union, including Moscow. And so in August of 1991, hardliners within the Soviet Communist Party arrest Mikhail Gorbachev. He's vacationing down here on the, the Black Sea, and they put him under house arrest in the Crimea. Uh, they call out the army. They seize the uh, parliamentary palace. Basically, it's the, the communist, it's, it's their, their, their uh, capital building, if you will. And they're, they're going to roll back all of these reforms. Now, this is one of those pivotal points in history because questions, questions are being asked. I'm watching this on live on TV because in 1991, I am a freshman in high school. And people are wondering, oh my God, is, is the Soviet Union going to go back to being the hardline Soviet Union that it had been in the 60s and 70s, not the warm and fuzzy Soviet Union of the late 1980s? What are the people going to do? Are they going to just say, okay, well, the, they're taking away our freedoms. We're going we're gonna to kowtow to them. What's the army going to do? What are these hardliners going to do? Are they going to order the army to shoot the protesters? Well, several things that you need to keep in mind. Again, each one of these... I'm pointing to the screen, and I, can't, I keep forgetting that you guys can't see me doing that. Each one of these republics has its own government. So there's not just an overall uh, government within the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is made up of these individual republics, and each one of them has a Communist Party-dominated republic government. 
and these republic governments, especially here in the Baltic, start to vote for independence. When the hardliners threaten to take away their power, because these leaders who are communists, let's, 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 not, let's not sugarcoat this, these leaders of these republics who are communists, they have gotten power as the central government has liberalized. They don't want to give that back up. So they vote for independence. And as you can see here, this numbered map down here shows you the order in which these republics vote for independence. So as these hardliners are seizing power between August and December of 1991, the Soviet Union starts to fall apart. The republics start to pull away. And are we going to see civil war? That's, that's a question that many news commentators are asking. Are, are we going to see a, a, a civil war in the Soviet Union? Well, the climactic event happens here in Moscow because in December of 1991, the president of Russia, not the president of the Soviet Union, but the president of Russia, a fellow by the name of Boris Yeltsin, the head of the Russian Communist Party, jumps on top of a tank, one of these, these army tanks that have been called out. And as you can see here, the flag that is flying is not the flag of the Soviet Union. It is the Russian flag because Boris Yeltsin is going to announce the succession of Russia. And he's going to call on the people and the army to side with him against these communist hardliners. And the army, this is, this, if you're a soldier in the Soviet army, the Red Army, here are questions that you're going to ask. Who do you obey? Who do you obey and why do you obey them? Because you've seen, you know, you've been affected by this freedom of information just as much as the civilians. You have seen the forces of nationalism and hatred against the, co the Soviet system firsthand. And what if you are a, a Red Army soldier that is not Russian? That you are from the Baltic, for example, and the Baltic has already declared its independence. Are you going to put down these protesters when your own people are no longer even part of the state that you serve? So what happens? The army turns against the hardliners. They side with Yeltsin. Tank guns shell the parliament, parliament, uh, parliament building. The hardliners are forced to give up. They're arrested, put on trial, put in prison. And on December 21st, 1991, the Soviet Union ceases to exist. This doesn't mean that the, it, there's anarchy. It doesn't mean that this geographic territory disappears off the face of the earth. It just means that the Soviet Union, as a political institution, is gone. And this raises several possibilities and also several problems. Because many in the West hope that Eastern Europe... And then, with the so fall of the Soviet Union, maybe even the Soviet Union itself, could be transformed into something that mirrored the West, something that looked like America and the, and the West. However, this is pretty much lost, and there are several reasons why. One of the first reasons is these people have very little experience in democratic institutions in self-rule. Remember, Russia, before it was the communist, before it was the Soviet Union and dominated by the communists in 1917, it was ruled by an autocratic monarch, the Tsar, Nicholas II. There has never been, until 1991, any experimentation in uh, Western liberal democracy. Now there had been some experimentation in places like Ukraine the Baltic states, and Eastern Europe. But since World War II, they had been under the heel, of course, the, the, the communist uh, dominated by Moscow as well. So they're having a hard time transitioning. This opens the door for, well, let's put it this way, both economic and political shenanigans. You see the Russian mafia taking basically control of various economic and even political aspects of, of Russian life. The Russian mob becomes very powerful during the 1990s. Also, Western institutions take advantage of the weakness of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Most notably, American, uh, uh, West, not, not American, but some American, but Western banks. Western banks uh, have, have been, uh, well, 
a lot of information has shown that they they basically loan shark. They they loan money to the former Soviet republics in Eastern Europe, but high interest rates and basically destroy the ability of the uh, uh, e these Eastern European countries to pay off the debts that they have. This is one of the uh, one of the the well, one of the things that Vladimir Putin, for example, holds against not only the United States but Western Europe in particular. Uh, he argues that American banks, Western banks, dominate that do, who dominate institutions like the IMF, um, basically use this as an opportunity to rob the Russians and the former the peoples of the former Soviet Union blind. And what's sad is there is some evidence that Putin is right. And what this causes is, well, this weakness causes people within the former Soviet bloc to hanker for order more than freedom. And it allows men like Vladimir Putin to come to power. Because Putin isn't a communist, but he is an authoritarian. He is a man where order, political and economic order, supersede political freedom every time. And so the treatment of this 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 area of the world in the 1990s of course leads directly to the, some of the problems and issues that we're dealing with today now what's another issue of the 1990s well the first one of the big ones is globalization what is globalization well globalization has many definitions if you're talking about globalization in terms of so uh, in terms of social interaction facebook and the internet are a good uh, example of globalization. You have the globalization of, of, of information. People have access to more information from broader sources. You also see the globalization of economies. Um, America, for example, the United States, most of the stuff that we buy today is not made in this country. Um, and this, this globalization, um, when, I, when, it, when it refers to economics, is talking about US economic policy. One of the big economic policies that came out of the 1990s was NAFTA. NAFTA, which stands for North American Free Trade Agreement, was passed during the Clinton, uh, Clinton presidency. Or I take that back, not the Clinton presidency. It was passed right at the end of the Bush presidency, but Clinton was a supporter of it. So it was passed in 91 and 92. Now what is NAFTA? Well, NAFTA is an economic alliance, if you will. It takes the United States, Canada, and Mexico and reduces or gets rid of all economic barriers to trade. So this means that the United States will not put tariffs, taxes, if you will, on goods coming from Mexico. It also means that certain Mexican companies can freely do business in this country. Now, why is economic, uh, these economic ties and treaties important? Well, many NAFTA supporters actually argued that NAFTA would lead to a closer alliance, a closer uh, 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 relationship between these three countries, just like Europe had, ex had experienced in the 1990s. Because right after World War II, France and Germany signed an agreement that created the European Coal Commission. This would very quickly evolve in the late 50s into what becomes known as the European Economic Community, the EEC. And in the early 1990s, the European, the European Community, the European Economic Community as it was known, would be transformed into the European Union. Now the European Union is kind of a new kind of political institution because it's not a country. It's not the United States of Europe. However, it does have a government. Most of you probably don't know this, but the EU actually has a parliament. The lower house is elected. The upper house is appointed by the functionaries within the European Union, the actual bureaucrats within the European Union. And the laws passed by the European Parliament affect the individual member countries. They, I mean, if they pass taxes or they pass environmental regulation, Germany, Spain, Greece have to obey. 
The big thing that the European Union coordinates or, and tries to control is economic policy. And one of the things that comes out of the, the creation of the EU is a common currency for most of the EU states, the so-called euro. That's why you no longer have a mark in Germany or a franc in, in, uh, in France. They all use the euro. Now the question becomes for many either supporters or opponents of closer political uh, relations like the European Union, is another level of government better for freedom or worse for freedom? I personally think that it's worse because it just it's more levels of government individuals have to deal with. However, supporters argue that this will allow closer cooperation between member states, allow for freer transportation. That's why you don't need to show your passport traveling between France and Germany anymore. You just travel straight through like you're going between Alabama and Tennessee. So this is the big issue today. And then finally, another form of economic globalization can be seen in the General Agreements of Trades and Tariffs, GATT. Now, GATT is not a government. What GATT is, is an economic agreement that the United States signed off on. GATT creates a system, if you will, a mechanism, whereupon signatories to the GATT agreement can actually find redress in, well, when it comes to economic problems between states. GATT creates what is known as the World Trade Organization, which is kind of like an economic court system. Because what happens if one country passes a tariff that is damaging to another country? Well, used to, the really the only response that the, the, the first victim country, if you will, would have would be either to raise its tariff against the first country or to declare war. Under the, under the GATT agreement, they now can go to the WTO and basically sue for redress and if you can believe this, Vladimir Putin, Russia is a signatory to GATT, as is the United States, is suing the United States over our economic sanctions being put on Russia over this Ukrainian issue. What happens if they win? Well, under the GATT agreement, a state that sues, if you will, can basically get the WTO to put sanctions on the first state. And all WTO members, or I should say all GATT members, all members of the uh, GATT agreement have to, well, follow that, that ruling. Now, beyond NAFTA, the European Union, and GATT, we have the expanding roles of what is known as either intra-government, non-government, or supra-government in organizations. What's a non-government organization? Well, a non-government organization would be something like Amnesty International. The Catholic Church is also considered a non-government organization. These are organizations that have influence in the international arena, but since they're not nation states, they're not recognized as governments. So in international affairs, NGOs have influence either through peaceful means, like for example, Amnesty International uses public pressure of uh, human rights abuses to bring pressure against target states. Um, Greenpeace does the same thing when it comes to environmental issues. The Catholic Church, moral issues. They can also use violence. The PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, is a is an NGO, at least up until the time that it became a go the government of the Palestinian Authority. These are recognized as having a place in international um, the inter international arena and they even get non-voting seats. They can actually sit in and speak their mind but not get to vote on issues in the United Nations. The United Nations being a supranational organization. A supranational being above the governments of nation states. Now the UN was created in 1945 at the end of World War II. Now for most of its existence early on, the UN was more or less a debate society, a way for countries to bring their, their grievances to the floor uh, or to the fore 
uh, in front of other member states of the UN. This is what the United States did during the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, when uh, Ambassador to the UN, Adley Stevenson, uh, brought photographs of these nuclear missiles in Cuba and basically made the uh, Soviet ambassador look like a fool. However, in the 1980s, but especially in the 1990s, supporters of the UN argued that the time was right at the end of the Cold War where the United Nations should take on a larger role and more of a role of a government, if you will, than it had been previously. These supporters argued that the UN could regulate glo the global environment, for example. That's why in the 1990s you have the so-called Kyoto Protocols, which is a UN summit held in Kyoto, Japan, aimed at regulating carbon output. Now, the United States does not sign off on this treaty. If the United States had, we would have to be paying more in terms of what we're buying because the uh, the uh, the, com the companies that we're buying stuff from would have to meet certain carbon limit uh, criteria laid out by the Kyoto Protocols. Uh, another way that the UN supporters of the UN argued that the UN could take a larger role is through peacekeeping. Now right now how the UN conducts peacekeeping is that member states loan military forces to the United Nations. However supporters argue supporters of the UN argue that this is messy and unreliable and that the UN needs a permanent peacekeeping force. Of course this means a standing army, a standing United Nations army. How do you support this? Well, of course, armies aren't cheap. You need money. Well, right now, the United Nations operates mainly, again, upon voluntary contribu contributions by member states, the United Nations giving a very large percentage of the United Nations budget. Supporters of the UN argued that the United Nations should not be beholden to its member states. Instead, it should be able to directly tax the citizens of the world. So, not only would you be paying an income tax to the United States government, supporters of for this this kind of uh, reform of the United Nations would want you to be paying taxes directly to the UN. So these are issues that are often behind the scenes uh, and are, on, are only now coming to light uh, today of what was going on in the 1990s. This is stuff that you guys need to be aware of. Now let's talk about the peace in the post-Cold War period. As all these political, um, you know, political um, changes and economic changes are taking place, and even social changes, many early in the 1990s hoped that, well, at the end of the Cold War, maybe we'll have finally the peace that people wanted after World War One. They didn't get it after World War Two. They didn't get it. Now it's after the Cold War. Maybe we'll get it. Well, they didn't get it because one of the problems with the end of the Cold War is what is called the peace dividend. The peace dividend was coined by Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton, between 1992 and 2000. Clinton argued that with the end of the Cold War, that we could lower defense spending. The problem with lowering defense spending is it actually hurts. It actually costs. Because in the 40 years of the Cold War, and of course the almost 10 years of World War II before that, so for almost half a decade, large defense contractors had become ingrained into the US and Western economies. They were crucial to hire, to employing people. They were, they were seen as necessary for research and development. And what has been created is what President Dwight D. Eisenhower warned the American public of when he left office in 1961. A military industrial complex had been created a military industrial complex that had vested interest would lobby for certain political policies especially in terms of foreign policy but was also economically powerful but also seen as economically essential because no one wanted to cut spending in their state or their district do you want to be the representative uh, from Seattle, Washington, where Boeing is located at, and basically tell Boeing and the people who work for Boeing that, yes, I voted to cut back on the acquisition of certain aircraft that Boeing built, and you're going to lose your job over it. 
Think about this. Boeing in Seattle, General Dynamics in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and in, in, in Texas. Texas Instruments, of course, in Texas. Um, these major defense contractors that you can Raytheon and, and uh, let's see here, I'm trying to think of, uh, let's see here, um, uh, Lockheed Martin, I mean, all of these major defense contractors employ large numbers of Americans. And it's not just the contractors that uh, need to be scaled back in order to realize the peace dividend. The U.S. military had built hundreds of bases during World War II and the Cold War, had maintained these bases up until 1989. With the end of the Cold War, many asked, do we need to have all these military bases and air bases and Marine Corps depots and stuff like that? Do we need all of these? Do we need all the ones overseas? And so the question became in the 1990s, especially the mid and late 1990s, what bases should we close? The problem for base closures is that, again, senators and House members didn't want to be the ones saying that I voted to close the base in my district. Because in some areas of the country, a military base is the economy. If you go to Colleen, Texas, I went to Colleen, Texas when I was at Texas A&M, and I can tell you right now, that town would cease to exist if Fort Hood was closed. Fort Hood, of course, was not closed because it was a major uh, U.S. base uh, for training of armor. But you know, this is a you know this is this is a major issue in you know in American politics. And it seemed that we couldn't cut back the military, not only for economic reasons, but because the '90s were not a peaceful decade. In some ways, the Cold War had actually stabilized the world because small states that were beholden to the superpowers had received money and weapons from both the United States and the Soviet Union, depending on who they were allied with. Along with this money and, money and guns came influence and power. And the superpowers used this to either keep wars small or to keep the peace. Now you might be asking, well, what about you know wanting to face off with each other? Well, the one thing that the superpowers wanted to avoid is a war that got out of control because a war like what almost happened in 1973 in the Middle East was a was a small war between Israel and its neighbors that could have potentially drawn the superpowers in and caused World War III. So during the 1980s, especially, wars were more clandestine. War war wars were kept small. And how did the superpowers keep them small? Well, they basically threatened their clients. Either obey what we tell you or we're not going to give you the money and the weapons. Also, the money that was given to countries around the world also propped up their, you know, their, their regular economy. It kept people employed. It kept food on people's tables. So in a way, the Cold War was actually peaceful. Kind of ironic, isn't it? The problem is the Cold War ended in 1989. And with that, the, tap, the money tap and the flow of weapons was cut off as well by the early to mid-1990s. And we see immediately that this causes a destabilizing effect. We see this most in terms of its largest impact in the first Gulf War of 1990 and 1991. Why did you know the, the end of the Cold War help destabilize the, the Middle East? Well, Saddam Hussein, the leader of Iraq, had been fighting an almost eight, almost a decade long uh, battle between Iran, its closest neighbor. Iran in 1979, of course, had underwent an Islamic revolution. The United States initially supported Iraq. So from 1980 up until about 1986, the United States sent money and weapons to the Iraqis, to Saddam Hussein. Did you guys know this? We supported Saddam Hussein, the man that we would fight against in Operation Iraqi Freedom. There's even evidence that the United States helped Saddam Hussein build up his poison weapons, uh, his poison gas, his, his, his weapons of mass destruction. Now, by 1986, the United States will pull its support from Iraq. 
and Iraq will start getting its support from the Saddam, from the Saddam Hussein will start getting its support from the the Soviet Union. But remember, the Soviet Union is an economic basket case. So instead of giving weapons to the Iraqis, the Soviets will sell weapons at a reduced price, but still sell them weapons. And of course, Saddam Hussein needs this money, you know, to get it from somewhere. So he borrows money from his neighbor, the wealthy emirate of Kuwait. Kuwait is not really a country; it's more of a kingdom. It has a prince, the uh, the the Emir of Kuwait. Now, Kuwait is incredibly wealthy. It is it is basically just a giant oil production facility, and so the Kuwaitis gleefully give Iraq money but at high interest rates and of course by 1990 they're calling those loans and Iraq well they don't want to pay so what is Iraq's solution well they one of their solutions is to undercut the world oil market to sell oil cheaper than anybody else of course, this infuriates not only the Kuwaitis, but the, the larger oil producers to the south, like Saudi Arabia. So this creates political tension between Iraq and its southern neighbors. Now, Saddam, who is a dictator and desperately wants to maintain his, of course, maintain his control over Iraq, cannot have these loans called, because that would drain the economy of Iraq and basically create a resentment among the, the Iraqi people. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, one analysis of the Iraqi military in the post-Iran-Iraq war period is that it really wasn't a military built to take on other countries. It was a military designed to basically keep the Iraqi people down. So the Iraqis are basically ticking off their neighbors by selling oil cheap and looking for a way to get out from underneath the, the loans that they have taken out from the Kuwaitis, mainly the Kuwaitis, but also other countries as well. And the sort of the straw that breaks the camel's back is that Iraq charges the Kuwaitis with what is known as side drilling. Because if you notice here, the oil fields are shared. They, the oil fields don't recognize political boundaries. And so what Saddam Hussein charges the Kuwaitis with doing is they're drilling down here, but side drilling under the ground into the Iraqi side of the oil fields. Now, the funny thing is, we now know the Kuwaitis were actually doing this. They were stealing Iraqi oil. They were doing this in reprisal to Iraq selling their oil so cheap. But this is an excuse Saddam Hussein has been looking for because now he can charge the Kuwaitis with being at fault and invade them. And that's what he does in August sec or August of 1990. In August of 1990, Iraqi military forces pour across the border and not only seize the oil fields but seize all of Kuwait. Now, I grew up during this time period. I was sitting in your seats when this was going on and of course the government of, you know, our government under George Bush Sr. was making this about, uh, you know, independence of countries and freedom and stuff like that. And I will tell you right now, this is utter and complete hogwash. The first Persian Gulf War was about oil. Because, like it or not, the Western economies are built on that black liquid. If it does not flow, our economies collapse. And the fear was that Saddam would not stop with just Kuwait, that Saddam may go on and invade Saudi Arabia. So, what does the U.S. do? The U.S. builds a coalition. The U.S. will send American military forces, but also we will fight alongside Saudi military forces, those of the, of the Kuwaitis who have escaped, Egyptians, French, British, Italians, and this coalition, as it becomes known, will first stabilize the border here, protecting Saudi Arabia under what becomes known as Operation Desert Shield. Now, Desert Shield will last until January or January of 1991, January 15th, 1991, because it is that deadline that President George Bush Sr. gives Saddam Hussein to withdraw from Kuwait. When Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis failed to do so on January 16th, 
1991, the coalition led by the United States will not only invade Kuwait, but come through the southern desert here, the waste of the Iraqi desert right here, and engage the Iraqi military, pretty much destroying everything in their wake. So these militaries that had been built up to fight the Soviets are now being used in the Middle East. And of course, we win! And we're still sort of trying to figure out whether we won in reality or not. What is another effect of the post-Cold War period? Well, if we go back here, let me see here, I'll find a map for you guys. If you look at Europe, actually, I don't have it, but there we go, we'll use this map. If you look at Europe right here, there's a small little country right here that was in existence up until the early 1990s. It's Yugoslavia. Now, no, I don't want sticky keys. Now, up until the early 1990s, up until the end of the Cold War, Yugoslavia had been a relatively stable country. However, in 1990, Yugoslavia starts to fall apart. Because Yugoslavia, like many countries in Eastern Europe, are made up of multiple ethnicities. But unlike Czechoslovakia, which votes to basically divide itself into two, there's a question of who's going to control the territory and whether the country should fall apart at all. The Serbians, for example, which is the largest and most powerful ethnic group within Yugoslavia, did not want to see Yugoslavia fall apart because they basically had the most influence over that country. However, the Croats, the Montenegrins, the, uh, the, the, the Albanians within uh, Yugoslavia, and most notably the people of Bosnia-Herzegovina, wanted to break free. This becomes a very nasty ethnic war because Croatia is made up of Croats. Serbia is made up of Serbians. Montenegro is made up of Montenegrins. However, Bosnia and Herzegovina, let's just call it Bosnia for, from now on, Bosnia is made up of Bosnian Croats, Bosnian Serbs, and Bosnian Muslims. There is not one dominant ethnicity in Bosnia. And so Bosnia will become a battleground between these three ethnic groups. The Croats will receive aid from Croatia. Of course, the Serbians will receive a, a lot larger amount of aid from Serbia, which is a larger ethnicity. The Bosnian Muslims, on the other hand, don't have anybody really to give them very much aid. And so it's the Mo Bosnian Muslims in Bosnia that will be more victim than victimizer. That, that's why in the Western press, uh, the Bosnian Muslims are often portrayed as innocent victims. Again, history is a lot more complex than that because all three groups are practicing what is known as uh, ethnic cleansing. It's a modern kind of nice euphemism for genocide or mass murder. Trying to clear Bosnia of the respective ethnicities uh, that they don't like. And the reason why the Muslims, of course, become more victim than victimizer, even though they try to be the ones forcing the other people out, is that they do not have external aid coming to them like the Croats and especially the Serbians. Now, what will happen? Well, we will see genocide. We will see this reported on the news. And the United Nations will pass resolutions condemning this. NATO... The, remember, the organization, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, created to fend off the Soviets, is going to basically retask its mission. NATO is going to sort of reinvent itself as a European army, if you will, a European peacekeeping force. And I-4 under NATO, I-4 standing for international force, will be sent into Bosnia to try and stabilize the region while peace negotiations are carried out. In 1996, the Bosnian Wars will end after the Dayton Accords of 1996 are signed. However, war in the Balkans will continue all the way up to the early 2000s. We see this also in the developing world, like Asia, places like Indonesia, but most, most 
prominently in Africa. If you look at Africa, Africa is made up of newly, new states. Remember, these are states that got their independence from European empires as late as the 60s and 70s. They have been under the heel of European colonizers for over a century. Before that, they had really no experience in Western democracy or Western-style government to begin with. So all of a sudden, you have these countries freed in the 60s and 70s, and what, what form of government do they tend to have? Well, they tend to have authoritarian and military dictators. These military dictators and authoritarian leaders maintain their, their control because they either side with the Soviets or they side with the United States, of course, receiving the cash cow that comes with it. They either get money or they get guns to, you know, to, to keep their population in check. But with the end of the Cold War, that money that had been keeping their economies going, well, that ceases to come in. And the guns, the cheap or free guns that comes in, uh, to keep their militaries up, well, that is cut off as well. And so many of these countries fall into civil war as finally the opponents of these military dictators, many of them or want to be military dictators themselves, are fighting it out in places like the Congo or, or even worse, you see ethnic uh, tension in Rwanda between the Hutus and the Tutsis. You see some states like the state of Somalia completely fall apart. I mean, it, it, it's still a territory. It's known as Somalia, but it has no effective government or any effective kind of local control. Instead, whoever is strongest in terms of just raw strength um, uh, is, the, is the person in control of various sections of Somalia. Um, this also affects the this also affects uh, the economies because when you have the breakdown of society, literally, um, we have you know the breakdown of the economies, the breakdown of commerce, the breakdown of food production. So hunger explodes in the 1990s. And this is one reason why, uh, you have the Black Hawk Down incident where U.S. forces are, are pretty beaten up, bloody, pretty badly. What happens in Somalia? Well, Somalia becomes what is known as a failed state. It has no effective government either at the local level or at the national level. And so the U.N. starts sending food in because the Somali economy is gone. It's non-existent. But the warlords, these, these, these strong men, seize the food, use it to feed their, their private armies or to buy weapons on the, on the black market. Um, and what happened was is that military forces under the UN were, were sent in first to stabilize the food distribution, but also to go after those warlords. One of the more powerful ones was a fellow by the name of Adid. And this is the target of the U.S. Special Forces that are sent in during what is known as the Black Hawk Down incident. Now, these weak states or failed states offer another, uh, uh, another problem, if you will, in the 1990s. Because they offer a haven for terrorist organizations. Terrorists are another form of NGO, non-government organization. They, instead of pressing their political agenda via uh, politics or economics or public pressure, they do, th do so through uh, what is known as asymmetric warfare, terrorism. They basically bring terror to target populations. And terrorists traditionally have had difficulty organizing because these are basically criminal organizations. Uh, they have to operate under the surface. However, when you have a failed state or a weak state, like in Somalia, you now have a training ground where the terrorists themselves can become the strong men of that region, controlling parts of, of these failed states, and thus organize much more effectively. Now, let's go back and look at the United States, because what's going on here in this country while all of this overseas is going down? Well, Bill Clinton, former governor of Arkansas, is elected in 1992 and he campaigns as what he calls a new Democrat. Because under the Clinton administration you will see some shrinking of the federal government. You will see welfare reform for example. You will see a reduction in the growth of the federal government. However, is the government really shrinking? Do we have small government or big government? Well, 
Actually, it's not really shrinking. It is shifting the responsibility for paying for government. Because while at the national level, the federal government is able to balance the budget for the first time since World War II, and we do it for two years, one of the reasons why we're able to do this is not only because of some issues like welfare reform, but because Clinton basically pushes the responsibility for paying for certain programs down onto the states. These become known as unfunded mandates or state mandates. An unfunded mandate is basically where the federal government says, okay, we're going to continue to tell you what to do in terms of, say, education, but we're not going to pay you as much. The Department of Education is going to cut the pay uh, coming from the federal government to the individual states, but if you want to get the reduced amount of money, you still have to pay the full amount. That means the states have to pay it. That means their budgets go up. That means sometimes they have to raise taxes. So, in reality, this is kind of a, a, a shell game, if you will, to hide the cost from the American people. Now, what else is going on in the 1990s? Well, in 1993, Bill, Clinton's, uh, Bill Clinton uh, will shepherd through the uh, democratically controlled Congress what becomes known as the assault weapons ban. This is one of the first major gun control pieces of legislation since, 19, uh, since the 1980s and especially since the 1968 gun, uh, gun Control Act. What does it do? Well, it purports to outlaw military-style weapons. Supporters argue that military-style weapons are not, you know, shouldn't be in civilian hands. And of course, one of the main criticisms of the assault weapons ban is that supporters paint it as a way of banning automatic weapons, machine guns. Well, it doesn't. Machine guns were were regulated by the 1934. Uh, National Firearms Act. The assault weapons ban regulates those guns or bans the production or sale of those guns that are semi-automatic, you know, one shot with each trigger pull, but look like their automatic counterpart. So one of the criticisms is that it's targeting weapons just for how they look, not what they actually do. And of course the gun ban will sunset. That means it will go out of effect 10 years later in, the two, in 2004 uh, after uh, it, su it sunsets, uh, it, it had a uh, it had a clause in it basically that it had to be re-upped, and Congress does not do that in 2003-2004. Also, in the early 19, the early first, the first, if you if you want to put it this way, the first uh, uh, term of Bill Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton's wife, Hillary Clinton, uh, the current Secretary of St um, she, she's not the current Secretary of State, not anymore. What is she? She was a senator from New York. She was the, sen the she was the Secretary of State, and I think she is now gone rogue, if you will. She's she's no longer attached to the government officially, I don't think. Uh, but um, Hillary Clinton will head a committee, a presidential committee, on the reform of health care, and what is proposed from this committee becomes known as Hillary Care. Hillary Care is, to put it bluntly, the forerunner of Obamacare. Actually, it would have went even further. Hillary Care would have created a single payer, the government basically paying health care through taxes. And of course, th this creates a lot of resentment and a lot of opposition, not only amongst Clinton's political uh, opponents, but also the American people. This is why in 1994, during the congressional elections, the Democrats lose both houses of Congress. This is the first time that the Democrats have not either controlled the House or the Senate. And for approximately four years, the Republicans will control both houses of the Senate. Now, the leader of the House, uh, a, Georgia, a Georgia congressman by the name of Newt Gingrich, will propose what is known as the Contract with America. Now, the Contract with America is a, a political agenda of the Republicans, namely to shrink government spending, uh, to cut back on welfare programs. This is one of the reasons why welfare reform actually goes through. Clinton takes credit for it, but he only deserves part credit because this is also a reform issue that the Republicans are pushing. 
Now, it's not just political uh, controversy that is going on during this time period. The Clinton administration is, is, is beset by numerous scandals. The most noted is the Monica Lewinsky scandal. In 1998, a relatively unknown internet blogger by the name of Matt Drudge, the, the creator of what becomes known as the Drudge Report, uh, breaks a story that Bill Clinton has been having sex with interns in the White House. This coincides with a 1997 uh, disclosure that Drudge also sort of breaks in the mainstream that the Clintons, both Hillary and Bill Clinton, may have illegal, illegally profited from a land deal in Arkansas using Clinton's office as governor to basically well, rig the game in their favor. This becomes known as whitewater. So these two issues, which are, to put it bluntly, completely different, become intermeshed with each other. So starting in 1998, you see the investigation of Bill Clinton, not only for whitewater, but also for his personal proclivities in the White House. During this time period, it is it, is, it comes to light that uh, certain FBI files on certain important congressmen and senators are found in Hillary Clinton's office. Now, the, what, are the, what are in these FBI files? Well, when you apply for any government job, if you run for office and you win, the FBI does background checks on you. The FBI asks people that know you, you know, what kind of person are you, what kind of dirt you have. These files are, well, to put it bluntly, can be damning. So there's a question of, were the Clintons using this information contained in the FBI files to blackmail their political opposition? And so this continues on until 1998. In December of 1998, Bill Clinton is impeached by the Republican House. However, what do they impeach him for? Do they impeach him for political corruption, the FBI files? Do they impeach him for, you know, shenanigans that went on while he was governor? No, they impeach him over lying about whether or not he had sex with Monica Lewinsky, which is, while you could say unethical as president, it's not illegal. Many previous presidents had had sex while they were president with somebody other than their wife. JFK is the most noted example. So when the Senate is given these charges, they refuse to even hear it. And of course, Bill Clinton becomes one of the only presidents to be impeached, but he is not tried. Now, what are what is you know what is uh, uh, the for the last controversy of the Clinton era? Well. It actually has to do with not his last election, but the election concerning his uh, potential successor. The 2000 presidential election is between Bill Clinton's vice president, Al Gore, and George Bush Sr.'s son, George W. Bush. In Florida, the national news media calls the race in Florida for Al Gore. The problem is the counting of the the you know the the, the um, tickets is not over with and by the end of the night the news media has to retract it and call Florida for George W but this doesn't end the controversy because almost immediately people start questioning were all the tickets counted and were they counted correctly because in 2000 Florida uses a system that, this is the best way to describe it, you have a list of names, so if you had a list of names right here on the screen, you have a list of names down through here, and on the side next to the name you would have a hole. A hole that was perforated and you took this sort of pencil looking thing and you punched the hole out. And that way they took the ticket and they ran it through a mechanical counter and of course it would count uh, where the hole was at. Well, it turns out these things were misaligned. And so people argued that they were confused about who they were actually voting for. When, the, when you punched them out, the Chad would still be there. So if the Chad was so-called hanging and it wasn't completely knocked out, 
it would not count. It would just go through and it would count that nobody was voted for. And so during 2000, you know, when the American public should know who their president was, instead, the Bush campaign and the Gore campaign would fight legal battles over whether or not these hanging chads would be counted, how they would be counted. It would actually go before the Supreme Court. And finally, you would have a series of hand counts where they're literally having people hand counting these things. Where, And this is how a political hand count goes. It's not just one person counting them. You have a box of tickets. I count them, but I'm the Democratic counter. And I put it in, I give it immediately to the Republican counter, and they eyeball it, and they put it down. And if everything goes right, my count and the Republican count, if I'm the Democratic counter, will coincide with each other. And so this, this is what has to go on to figure out who the president is. So in this country, many Americans got, get very discouraged with politics because it just seems that Washington is just this cesspool of sex and corruption and you know so on and so forth. Maybe they're right. Now the 1990s, in both international politics but also domestic politics and domestic social issues, bring forward issues that had been around but it kind of been pushed down or pushed to the back of the stove. They're on the back burner of the stove because of the Cold War. One of them is, of course, the environmental movement, environmentalism. The modern environmental movement, something that is different than the traditional conservation movement, was sort of, you know, it sort of came into the fore, was, 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 came onto the scene in the early 1970s. The very first Earth Day, of course, was held in the 1970s. So environmentalism was around in the 70s and 80s, but it's in the 90s that environmentalism becomes sort of, you know, at the forefront. And of course, in the 1990s, the, one of the major issues that, that many people here in the United States are concerned about is global warming. Is the globe getting hotter? Is the world warming up? And with it, are we going to have more droughts? Are we go, are the deserts are, are the deserts going to expand? Is food production going to drop off? Are we you know is water is water going to dry up? You know these are the sort of the horror you know the pictures of horrible a horrible future that many environmentalists paint. Now this has come under criticism just within the past two years because two years ago one of the researchers that had been f instrumental in in creating this 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 idea of global warming had to admit that the research that they based their 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 policies on well to put it bluntly they made them up they they basically added information where the the actual statistics and and research data was lacking and so this is one reason why you don't hear that much about global warming anymore you start to hear it referred to as climate change so this is an issue that we should be debating. Is there such a thing as global warming? Is there such a thing as climate change? Is it is it a policy that people are pursuing or standing against purely because of their stand on the environment or whether they believe in it or not? Or are they for or against global warming based on their political viewpoints? Because one of the issues when it comes to global warming or climate change is the role of the government. Because many environmentalists who support global warming legislation want not only national governments, but even the UN, hence the Kyoto Protocols, to regulate human activity for the sake of the environment. I personally, I'm going to let my opinion out right here, I personally don't believe in global warming. I don't believe that the Earth is warming based solely on human activity. I think the sun and the cycle has much more to do with it. I do, however, think that environmentalism is, a, is an important issue. I just take a different stand on it. And one of the things that I do agree with is the dangers of what you might call a throwaway society. Uh, because in the 1990s, you start to see recycling bins pop up all over the place. If you go into your school today, you probably have recycling bins all over the place because we, are, we have become a throwaway society. Everything you buy is pretty much limited to what it was designed to do and nothing more. Let's take for example, if you can see this, my iPhone. High tech technology right now, but this is an iPhone 4S and they're already up to the iPhone 5S. So what happens 
I need to plug this thing in, so hold on a minute. So what happens when my iPhone 4S becomes obsolete? When I throw it away? Do I throw it away, or is there some way to recycle this thing? Well, actuality, or in actuality, there, there's actually little way to recycle a lot of what is known as e-trash. Your laptops that you guys use in class, those components will be obsolete. They won't be incorporated into a new machine. Uh, many of the components uh, don't have recycle value. So what happens to these things? Many of them will be scavenged for what can be stripped from them in terms of uh, metals and things like that. But a lot of them will be just ground up and put into a landfill. Think about all the water bottles that you throw away. These water bottles uh, have been designed uh, so that some are recyclable or some are not. Compare this with American society 50 years ago. 50 years ago, you drank out of glass. Glass could easily be ground up, remelted, reused, or even incorporated into asphalt, for example. Uh, most of the stuff that was used, like TVs, um, I remember my grandparents had an old TV that they used. They bought it. They bought the thing back in the late 60s, but it was a color TV, so they still used it. Uh, it was one of the ones that you had to get up and turn the channel because it had no remote on it. But it had a wooden cabinet, and everything in it was made out of metal. The metal can be melted back down, and the wood rots. Today, most of your TVs, like your flat screens or whatever, are all plastic. Which is more recyclable? This is one of the issues that we have to deal with in this country. Also, the post-Cold War period brings things such as AIDS, international health, and hunger to the forefront. In some areas of the world, like you see here on this map, there's some areas of the world where AIDS is up to and close to 40% of the population. So somebody who is HIV positive, there are more than one in three of them in that country as a whole. And in some areas of these countries, like, for example, if you go to these coastal areas, I've heard reports that almost the entire populations are HIV positive. Why is this? Well, one reason is, of course, the end of the Cold War, the end of the money, the free money coming from either the Soviet Union or the United States, the end of all of this international aid. Also, it's the cultures. They, 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 they don't want to use condoms because that's not seen as, 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 as manly. And... So you have the combination of, of people literally using sex as a commodity to buy food and the necessities of life, but refusing to use any kind of contraception or protection for fear of, of cult cultural taboos. And of course, what is the effect on, on our society? Well, you have people like Bono from YouTube, U2, not YouTube, but U2, you know, coming and telling Western society that it is our duty to help out these countries. Now, let's talk about the Internet. Because you guys being what they call the millennial generation, you guys are, have been the, the first generation to actually just literally grow up with the, with the Internet. The Internet has always been there since most of you were born, because I, I know I keep forgetting this since I, I'm used to teaching people who are a little, just a little bit older than you guys, but you guys are 16 and 17 years old. That means that the Internet has been around as long as you have. <laughs> because the Internet came to Tennessee at UT over here in 1995 and you know that is well 19 years ago so the era of most people having the internet in their homes started in the late 1990s so from probably the the time period that you can first remember you remember having a computer in your house and it may have been an earlier computer that had to be hooked into a wall line or even a dial-up connection but you had internet so how has the internet changed the world and how has the internet changed America? Before we get to that question, let's talk about who built the internet because who built the internet kind of reflects how the internet changed our society. Because some people, like for example Al Gore here, claim that the foundations of the internet were laid by the US government. And there's some truth to this. You know, Al Gore gets made fun of because he said, I, I built the Internet. Al Gore didn't build the Internet. If he claims to have built the Internet, he's a fool. But what happens is 
or I should say what happened, is that in the 1960s and early 1970s, the U.S. government created what was known as the DARPA net. DARPA is the very secretive research arm of the U.S. military. They're the guys who come up with all the really high-tech goody, goody weapons. You know, stuff like drones, for example. DARPA wanted to be able to communicate not only with the military, but also with the universities doing the research. So what that was created was what amounted to a very crude email system interconnecting universities, military inst installations, government, you know, government institutions, and of course, you know, DARPA. This is the framework that the World Wide Web is built off of. However, it is not until the early 1990s that you see that what, it, what, what we called at UT the Gopher Network. That's what, that's what it had evolved into, basically just a, an email network. What changed the, the Gopher Network from just purely a text-based system to the World Wide Web of pictures and streaming video and everything like that were private businesses realizing the potential of the internet and investing in storage space, server capacity, you know, high-tech you know, transmission lines and all of these things. And also, you know, the very computers that we watch this stuff on. All of these 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 entities, these 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 corporations and, and businesses kind of feeding off of each other as they built up the internet. And one in particular, because think about the internet. Before 9-11, the internet was relatively anonymous. It was very hard to track who was doing what on the internet. You were, you were a random IP address. So you have relative anonymity. You also have increasing access to pictures, so there's a demand for high quality pictures. Who's, who is demanding high quality pictures? Who are the first people who are demanding streaming video or downloadable videos? But they want to remain relatively anonymous. It's not terrorists. Terrorists don't give a crap about watching videos. So don't say that. It's people who want to watch porn. So Larry Flynn here, the man who founded Hustler, is far more influential in building the internet than any other institution, even the U.S. government. Why do I? Why can I say this? Well, here, let me show you some statistics. In 2010, CNET Daily, it's an online uh, computer magazine, CNET News, did a study of the relative change in internet business. They looked at percentages of websites, and percentages of web traffic. In 2000, between 1999 and 2000, the percentage of the internet that were pornographic websites, so ladies like this, and a lot less than that right there, was close to 33 to 34% of the internet. That's one third of the internet. One third of the internet is porn or at least porno sites. However, this is the statistic for the, per the percentage of web traffic is even more showing because guess how much web traffic of all internet web traffic that these ladies are getting? Close to 45 percent. So almost half of all internet traffic in 2000 are people going to look at ooh, naked women and naked men, but most of it's naked women. What does that say about us? What does that say about the people in our society? Well, today, according to CNET News, in 2007, this has changed because now the number of porno sites in terms of percentage of the whole internet has shrank. It's down to, I believe, around 18 to 20 percent. So it's less than one fifth of the internet. Has it actually shrank in actual quantity? No, it's actually grown. But the internet itself has grown with the introduction of things like Facebook, Twitter, and other social networking. Because today, according to CNET, in 2007-2008, the percentage of web traffic 
has shifted toward social networking rather than porno sites, even though porno sites still get about 25% of all web traffic. So this is the question I want to put to you guys. What does the creation, the building, and the current state of the internet reflect about us? Because many supporters of the internet argue that the internet is this sort of free domain of information, of people seeking to basically better themselves, educate themselves, and express themselves. Is that really the case? Or is it people wanting to have anonymous access to pornography? Or is it people just wanting to be able to talk to people electronically and tell them, like some people that I know who have Twitter accounts, where they're literally saying everything that they're doing? You know, I'm going to the store. I'm, you know, going to the bathroom. I'm, you know, five minutes away, I'm going to go and take, you know, go to bed for the night. You know people who, who have diarrhea of the mouth when it comes to their Twitter account. Is it just an extension of normal corporate America? where you have eBay and Walmart and Amazon.com just selling us stuff. What does the internet reflect about us? One of the interesting comments and, and, and sort of things that I can share with you guys since I was in college, I was just a few, you, few years older than you in the early and mid 1990s. I graduated from high school in 93, 94. The internet of the 90s was more like the Wild West. You could find almost anything in a text format. Today you can go on YouTube and you can go on, you know, any website and you can find, you know, any kind of picture, even the pornographic type. I mean, you know, you can find this stuff today. Back around 95, 96, 97, pictures were incredibly pixelated. You had no, you know, no such thing as streaming video. But in terms of news, in terms of what people thought, in terms of information, it was. It was the Wild West. Because back then, you didn't have blogs. You didn't have people posting stuff to their MySpace account or Facebook account or making YouTube videos. People had their own web pages because they could say anything then. Today, you can't. I don't know if you guys understand this, but there have been court cases against YouTube, against Facebook and Twitter for people posting things that they want to express, but though their accounts being suspended or being banned because they go against the, the website that they're using. So these are some issues, again, that we must be aware of. Now, let's talk about just some continuing social issues be, beyond the fact that people want to buy stuff on YouTube, watch pornography, and, and uh, you know, tweet what they're watching on the Internet uh, on, on Twitter. What are some of the issues of the 1990s? Well, blacks in this country still face some serious problems. We see this in the uh, appointment of a black Supreme Court justice and also the Rodney King riots. Clarence Thomas, Clarence Thomas who is now sitting on the US Supreme Court, when he was being uh, appointed and uh, confirmed by the Senate in the late 80s and early 1990s, he was, appointment, he was appointee of George Bush Sr. You have an allegation made by this woman right here. This is Anita Hill. Anita Hill claiming that Thomas had made unwanted sexual advances when she worked in his office. And so is this a black on black controversy or is this a man versus woman uh, controversy? This is one of the things that was really interesting about the Clarence Thomas case because the race card combined with the sex gender card came into play and, and you, you, you didn't know what side you, to take. Uh, you watched this in, the polit in, in, in political circle, circles or read it in magazines or watched it on the news. Uh, people were very wary of what they were going to say because to, to side with Anita Hill uh, oftentimes meant that you were being 
uh, racist. Well, she's black. How can you be racist? Well, if you sided with Clarence Thomas, you were sexist. Now, getting off of the case of Clarence Thomas, one of the more key issues is, of course, the case of Rodney King. Rodney King and O.J. Simpson, but let's talk about Rodney King first. Who is Rodney King? Well, Rodney King, to put it bluntly, is a drug addict. A drug addict that was high on, I believe, PCP, but he is pulled over by the Los Angeles Police Department and black advocates in the 1980s. Like Ice-T, for example, made several uh, rap music, uh, uh, rap videos and rap, uh, rap songs about this. One of the one of ones that I can remember off the top of my head that was so controversial was one called Cop Killer. That was actually the title of the al album as well. Because men like Ice-T and other black commentators argued that cops in this country, especially the Los Angeles Police Department, were incredibly brutal when, it, when they were dealing with black suspects. And white America could pretty much kind of ignore it because this was happening in black neighborhoods. However, in the mid-1990s, Rodney King is pulled over, and during the course of this traffic stop, four Los Angeles Police Department uh, officers beat the crap out of the man. They beat him. And the reason why we know they beat him to the point of, well, they overdid it, is someone taped it. Someone recorded the beating and this was seen on, the nas on national news. This caused uh, outrage in both white but especially black communities and the four police officers were put on trial. The controversy arises when they are acquitted. They are acquitted by an all-white jury. Because of this acquittal, blacks in Los Angeles riot and they burn down large sections of their own neighborhoods. Now, it's not, in a lot of cases, this isn't a case of black Americans rioting just over the Rodney King decision. This is pent up anger over being, of, of feeling that they've been locked out of the American dream. That they are in these, these, these black neighborhoods where you have high crime, you have, you have, uh, gangs, you have poverty, combined with the fact that you know the drug problem, the drug war, and the continuing abuse of officials that were, are supposed to protect and serve them just as much as everybody else, leads to sort of this release, uh, this violent release because of the Rodney King riots, you know, or, that, or that is the that is the uh, uh, the violent release. You also see the sort of the continuing tension between white America and black America in the O.J. Simpson trial. O.J. Simpson, um, athletic, you know, superstar, later on uh, uh, movie hero. Uh, one of the movies that I can remember him in is the uh, Towering Inferno of the 1960s, early 1970s. In the 1990s, O.J. Simpson, OJ Simpson is, is uh, accused of killing his wife and uh, what may have been his wife's estranged wife, I should say, his wife's uh, boyfriend, or it could have been just a random guy who was returning her sunglasses. Um, I can't remember the fellow's name offhand. Um, but these two individuals are found brutally murdered with a knife, not shot, uh, in her house, right, right, basically at the front door, and O.J. Simpson is charged with the murder. This, of course, goes to trial. From my own personal viewpoint, in looking back at the O.J. Simpson trial, this was a media and it's a media circus, and the the, the people trying the trial did not help it one bit. But what happens is O.J. Simpson is acquitted, and. Again, I was in college because this, this happened uh, in 94 and 95. Um, no, I take that back. The O.J. Simpson trial. Let me see here. I want to I wanna make sure I give you the right date. I, think, I might be thinking of the... Yeah, 
Let's see the Rodney King riots uh, were. 1992 were the Rodney King riots, and uh, let's see here, the O.J. Simpson murder trial. Um, yes, it was 1995. The, the verdict came down in, in October of 1995. Um, because I could remember when I was at UT in 1995, um, Actually, you know, we were we, we actually discussed this in a class similar to you yours. It was a Western Civ class uh, discussion group, and the graduate student who was proctoring it asked the question of, "What do you believe about this verdict? Do you believe that it's correct or false or or whatever?" Um, and I remember one of my fellow students who happened to be a, a young black woman. She just kind of randomly made the comment that I really don't know what happened in the case, but at least a black man got off. And this is one of the one of again one of the the tense one of the points of contention during the 1990s was that blacks accused of crimes tended to get poor representation than whites. Uh, they tended to not have the money to have, you know, high-priced lawyers. And so while white executives got, you know, no time and very little punishment for, you know, screwing old women out of, uh, out of their life savings, um, you know, black, uh, black, black people who were, uh, um, you know, blacks that were charged with, you know, selling a gram of cocaine uh, were getting 10 years. And they were, they, you know, this is one of those points of contention that, that, again, was, you know, sort of brought to the fore by the Rodney King riots and the O.J. Simpson case. Now, what about women in America? Well, again, the case of Clarence Thomas. I'm not going to revisit that. We're spending a little too much time on this slide anyway. But what is the place of, of women in the 1990s? Well, by the 1990s, women are starting to realize uh, many of the, the gains that they had been seeking. Um, women now had access to the upper echelons of academia, the upper echelons of business. Um, the, you know, basically, they were, they were making an end to what had been primarily male country up until the 1990s. But this, in and of itself, brought, well, problems. Because as women started to, to, to penetrate what had traditionally been what you might say the good old boys club, they experienced sexual harassment. This, this idea that, this I should say that not idea, but this issue of what is said, because sexual harassment can be more can be more than just physical harassment. It can be more than just you know a slap on the wrong part of the body or or unwanted you know advancement, as we see in the case of Clarence Thomas, or the accusations made against Clarence Thomas. It can be uh, off-color jokes. This is one reason why I have to go uh, through uh, uh, sexual harassment training. Uh, to teach you guys uh, so that I'm not making off-color jokes and making fun of women, making fun of minorities, uh, because this is seen as a form of harassment and making what is sort of coined in the 1990s as a hostile environment. Now, let's talk about a hostile environment. And can the, this hostile environment lead to, to uh, what is known as a hate crime? Because in the 1990s, we see the issue of, well, two issues. The two issues of hate crimes and gay marriage. What is a hate crime? Well, again, this is one reason why I, one of the benefits one of the benefits of uh, staying at home, you have the issue of violence against gays, violence against minorities, and is violence against these groups 
uh, different than just violence overall. This is brought really to the fore near the end of the 1990s in a case where a young black man, a, a man by the name of Matthew Shepard, uh, in 1998 in Wyoming, is beat up after leaving a bar and then tied to a basically a fence and left to die, which he does. Now the question becomes out of cases like the Matthew Shepard case, is it worse that this young man was killed because of his sexual orientation or is it the same as if he had been straight? Because supporters of hate crime legislation argue that since minorities, especially homosexuals, are the target of beatings, harassment, and even uh, violence in the form of attempted murder, or in this case, murder, that there needs to be uh, a stricter penalty uh, against that kind of violence. Opponents argue that no, this is, this is discriminatory. You're discriminating in favor of these so-called protected groups. And so hate crime legislation is still one of these issues that comes out of the 1990s that is still a pertinent issue today. Another issue that is right up on the forefront is the issue of gay marriage. Do homosexuals in this country have the right to get married? I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to leave it as I don't know. This is an issue that you, hopefully being better informed by this class and by reading your textbook and hopefully being wedded with a hunger to, to, to learn more, will make up your own mind. But this is an, also an issue that comes out of the 1990s. And then finally, I think this is very pertinent in terms of you know, allegations of NSA spying, of you know, whether it be George W. Bush or Barack Obama actively discriminating against their political opposition. The 1990s uh, is also a period where you see well, people start to ask the question, is their government, is the U.S. government representative of their views? Is it protecting their, their, their ideas, their, their viewpoints? Or is the U.S. government actually s taking steps against the American people? Now, some Americans believe that this is true, and they believe it in for, for two different reasons. Some of them argue that the U.S. government has become either racially or religiously against them. You have so-called racial separatists. These are people that are racist who want to live apart from racial minorities. You also have religious separatists. These are typically some fundamentalist sect of, of religion, uh, the Branch Davidians of the Waco compound that we'll talk about here in a minute would be considered re uh, religious separatists. These are groups that want to separate themselves from mainstream society because they argue that mainstream society has become corrupt. It's become amoral or immoral. Uh, and that as a result that they need to separate themselves uh, for whatever reason. And we'll talk about some of those reasons here in a minute. So you have the separatist movement. You also have something known as the Patriot Movement. Now, the Patriot Movement, while it may include racial or religious separatists, is a much broader movement. These are Americans who argue that the government has grown too big, that from the end of the Cold War through the 1960s and 70s, the U.S. government has taken on to itself powers that it should not have, that it is, that it is outside its constitutional uh, limitations. And it is the Patriot Movement who argues that the United States needs to be the United States government needs to be shrunk because it, it the government has become well its own interest. And part of the Patriot Movement, the more radical elements of the Patriot Movement movement, argue that the government has become well an antithetical. It's become hostile to freedom, to the American public, and as a result, Americans need to prepare themselves to actually take on the American government. So you see the rise of what is known as the militias of the 1990s. So what are some of the issues that drive this? Well, you see this in three occurrences. The first, the first two are good indications that the government um, well, it actually supports this idea that the government is actually too big. 
The first is something that happens in 1992 at a place called Ruby Ridge, Idaho. It has to do with this man right here. This is Randy Weaver. Now, Randy Weaver is a racial separatist. He believes that blacks and whites should not be living together and that he, he moved his family to this sort of, you know, very, very, very rural frontier almost existence in order to get away uh, from mainstream American society. Now, according to the initial storyline, Randy Weaver was manufacturing illegal firearms. And as a result, the FBI surrounded the cabin. Shots were fired against the FBI agents. And they, of course, returned fire, killing his son, wounding Randy Weaver, and then set, what set off was a, uh, a, a siege, if you will, of the Weaver compound. Well, as I told you guys at the beginning of class, history is far more complex, usually, than the initial storyline, um, the, the initial story that comes out. Because what has come out since 1992 is, this is sort of what we know as a fact. Randy Weaver was a religious separatist. He believed that the U.S. government was getting too large and was preparing to basically fight it off himself. However, he had not built any illegal weapons. A acquaintance of Randy Weaver would basically nag him to cut down a shotgun. What was unbeknownst to Weaver was that this man had been arrested for drug possession and drug manufacturing charges and he was now working for the government. The government was asking him to try and get Weaver to cut these shotguns down. This is, what, this is known as entrapment. This is illegal for the government to do this, but they do it. What happens is Weaver finally resents and cuts down two shotguns. He is ordered to basically come to court they charge him with manufacture of illegal firearms. And Weaver basically says, I don't recognize the authority of the U.S. government and refuses to show up for court. That's when the FBI is sent, is sent in. The FBI surrounds his compound. But they're dressed in camouflage. There's no, they're not wearing stuff that says FBI or, or, or federal agent. It's just guys in camouflage. And from the accounts of Weaver, so take this with a grain of salt, his son, himself, and a friend of his were checking on what what was, what was described as um, well. They 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 were kind of patrolling the compound, if you will. The son's dog barked and went after what it was barking at, which happened to be an FBI agent who promptly shot the dog. The son fired a shot and then ran. That shot prompted FBI snipers to shoot the son and shoot him in the back. Weaver, who is wounded in this occurrence, retreats to his, his cabin with the friend, and in the cabin is the rest of his family, including his wife and newborn child. The wife is standing next to a glass window door holding the child and is shot in the head by an FBI sniper. It takes a couple of more days for the, the two sides to work out basically a, a, a means for Weaver to, to give himself up. He is tried after being arrested and in the end is found innocent of all charges except for his failure to show up for the court date. He is found innocent because they find that he had been entrapped and they don't they find it innocent of the deaths of or at least I think one of the FBI agents is, is killed by the the son shot um, but this is a man who loses his family because of well the only thing I can say is a, an, a, an over anxious uh, FBI we also see this idea that the, the, oh, that the government overreacts in the case of the Branch Davidian uh, compound in Waco in 1993, the ATF will raid the uh, Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. Now, who are the Branch Davidians? 
Branch Davidians are a, Christ, a very radical fundamentalist Christian sect uh, read, led by a fellow by the name of David Koresh. Koresh argued that he was sort of like the reincarnation of, of, of he was the second coming of Christ. So this is kind of a very fringe group. Now, these are religious separatists. They moved to Waco, Texas, or outside of Waco, Texas, to basically separate themselves from mainstream uh, American society because they're waiting for the apocalypse. Now, in 93, in February of 93, uh, the ATF will raid their compound. They argue, they argue that they were, they're raiding the compound initially because there are, are uh, charges of sexual abuse between uh, the children that are there at the compound and David Koresh. However, the ATF doesn't deal with sexual crimes. They are people enforce gun laws. So this story changes to the fact that they are that the ATF ADF rep representatives argued that they were raiding because they argued that the Branch Davidians had illegal weapons. We won't know because what happens is the Branch Davidians will fight off the ATF. Uh, and the FBI will take over and lay siege to the Branch Davidian compound until April of 93. So between February and April you have this standoff between the Branch Davidians and the FBI. What ends is the Branch Davidian compound burns down, killing David Koresh and most of the people inside. Some Branch Davidians will survive. And the Waco raid, the Waco standoff, is still highly controversial. So let me give you some alternative information. Because there have been several documentaries that take into account the, 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 account, take into account the, the information from the survivors, as well as, uh, say, for example, FLIR imagery. The surviving Branch Davidians argued that the government actually shot in some form of accelerant and then set fire to the compound and then when people tried to escape that they were gunned down. Now it was well known that the FBI had been using psychological warfare tactics during the standoff like for example uh, at night they would use searchlights to keep uh, the windows lit up to deprive the Branch Davidians of sleep. They would play rock music and uh, rabbits getting killed. Um, over loudspeakers to try and basically traumatize the Branch Davidians inside to force them out. Um, the end of the the end of the of the Branch Davidians happened when tanks. They these are army tanks. They they they, they try and say that they're engineering vehicles, but th these are basically M60 tanks with with uh, booms on them. They're used as uh, recovery tanks, is what they are. Uh, these things have uh, hoses attached to, to them to, to spray in uh, tear gas into the Branch Davidian compound. However, it comes out later on that uh, these are, these are, this is military-grade tear gas. So this is, this is very volatile stuff. So the question becomes, does this, does this tear gas act as an inadvertent accelerant? The other thing is there's a great documentary that is available online for you guys. It's called Waco Rules of Engagement. I watched it when I was in Texas. Um, and one of the things that I know from my studies in, mili in the military is that FLIR does not see light. FLIR stands for forward-looking infrared uh, detection. So a FLIR camera could only see heat. It does not see light. And uh, the FBI and the ATF basically you know, wrote off and, and said that these flashes that can be seen on FLIR imagery taken during the raid were little glints of sunlight off of broken glass outside the compound. However, I know, I know personally, and I'm going to stand by this, that FLIR cannot see light. All it can see is flashes of heat. And these are very short-lived flashes of heat. And I think this confirms the, the accounts of the Branch Davidian survivors uh, that they were getting shot at. Because of these two incidences, some within the Patriot movement are going to act. One of them is a fellow by the name of Timothy McVeigh. Now, Timothy McVeigh is a former, um, he's a veteran of the Gulf War. Um, in my opinion, he's kind of one of these guys who's been kind of left 
left out of society. He's on the fringe of society. And in 1995, uh, McVeigh is going to drive a truck in front of the federal building, uh, in, uh, the Murrow Federal Building in Oklahoma City. This is the building that the Waco raid had been coordinated out of. And this truck contains uh, uh, a, so a what, do you, what do you call it, a, I forget what the compound is, it's, it's used for uh, fertilizer, but it can also be used if drenched in gasoline or diesel fuel, can be turned into an explosive. Uh, it's basically a fertilizer bomb, uh, and detonates it. He does so in retaliation for what he sees as the, basically the, the murder of the Branch Davidians at Waco. And, of course, also what happened at Ruby Ridge. So during the 1990s, what I'm getting at is you have a, a tension developing, not just a race, a, a tensions of race, racial tensions, not just of gender tensions, but also a tension, between, a tension between the government and the people because in the 90s, people started to ask the question, is it all right to stand up to the U.S. government? Because has the government got too big? What is going to be the government's response for people who don't want to live under its authority? These are questions that our country got started out asking. Now, I'm not saying that the U.S. is heading for revolution, but these are questions that had been kind of subsumed, kind of pushed back uh, ever since World War II. Because in World War II, Americans j rallied around the flag. During the Cold War, we rallied against communism. In the 1980s, we rallied around again the end of the Cold War and the evil empire. In the 1990s, well, the Cold War is over and we're not fighting a world war. And people start to ask questions again about the role of the individual versus its government. I'm going to leave, leave you with this, this thought and hopefully we will have a class discussion based off of some of these ideas that I presented in this entire lecture next class period, which is tomorrow. Again, I apologize for this being too late. Uh, or being so late, and I hope you guys will get a chance to read it or watch it. Uh, I will talk to you guys later. Um, have a good rest of this Sunday. I will t I will see you on Monday. Thank you. Three.